My name is Aaron Abke. I grew up in the Bay Area of California as a pastor's son. So church life was my whole life as a child growing up all through high school and into college. We talked about the love of God, the goodness of God, the forgiveness of God. And so at about 23 years old, I had gone to college to follow my dad's footsteps. I was leading worship for about eight years. And when I graduated from Oral Roberts University, I went back to the Bay Area to take my first church job as a full-time worship pastor. And that's when I was first confronted, almost backed into a corner, to face the ideologies I had been running from in my religion my whole life. Because the church I worked at was a very fundamentalist church, very different from the one I grew up in. Almost every sermon, there'd be something inserted about everyone else is doomed to hellfire if they don't repent and accept Christ. And the rapture is coming soon. And I had experienced a God of love in my heart my whole life because, you know, worship was really my passion, more of the bhakti yoga. And so I didn't resonate with that view of God. And within just a few months, I was in a kind of internal crisis of wrestling with the fact that I don't believe this stuff. And so accepting that was a really hard step for me because as many of the people listening probably know who grew up religious, when you leave your religion, you're not just leaving a faith tradition, you're leaving an entire paradigm of reality, a worldview. You're leaving your friends, your family, everything you've ever believed in. And so the fear of making that leap into the unknown keeps a lot of people from questioning. But I, I couldn't handle the internal conflict anymore at that point. So I just said, I've got to sell everything I own, move across the country, start a new life, completely re rediscover myself and what I believe about the divine. And so at 23 years old, I quit the job I had just gotten. I did lose almost all of my friends at that point and most of my family outside of my parents and sister pretty much never spoke to me again. But when you're convicted so deeply, I think about who you know God to be and you want to understand the divine on a deeper level, you're willing to make those sacrifices and I think that's what makes it an authentic expression. My biggest passion outside of spirituality was always fitness. And so I found myself in fitness and in CrossFit and bodybuilding and, and things of that nature. Uh, I became a fitness model in San Francisco. Uh, I competed in bodybuilding at the national level. I was very successful in everything I was doing. And I worked at Google at the time with a contracting company named Exos that was a fitness contractor to do personal training at Google. So I was working in the Bay Area at essentially the biggest company in the world, doing what I loved, making good money. And on the outside, had it all, but on the inside, I was crumbling because Christianity and my faith in God, my faith in Jesus was my whole life. And so I, I wasn't able to ever find myself again without that. And no matter what I did, I always was left so unsatisfied and so unfulfilled. And so I would cover it up with more vanity, more muscles, more fitness, more Instagram posts. But on the inside, I was sort of unraveling and becoming more depressed by the day, living a sort of inauthentic life. It wasn't what gave me joy. It wasn't what made me feel fulfilled because I just didn't have a purpose. I didn't have uh, a reason for waking up anymore like I used to as a kid. I used to wake up so in love with God and so excited to experience the day with God. Without that, I just didn't feel any motivation anymore. And so I was seeking enlightenment teachings through Alan Watts and Eckhart Tolle and Muji and other ancient texts. And one of the things I was doing every day at that time was going up to the balcony above the gym that I worked at at Google and spending about an hour on my lunch break just listening to Eckhart Tolle or Alan Watts and just kind of watching the clouds. I had done this for months at this point and so I can't tell you exactly what it was about that certain day but I was listening to a lecture from Eckhart where he was repeating things to the audience that the ego says to each and every one of us. Things like, if only people liked me more, then I would truly be happy. Or if only I had more fame or success, then that would truly make me happy and fulfilled. And he would laugh after each one he would repeat. And I was laughing because I recognized exactly what he was saying were, the, were all the thoughts that my mind was feeding me every day to keep me depressed and feeling hopeless about life. And so if this guy knows exactly what my mind says to me and this whole audience is laughing because clearly their minds say it to them too, then maybe it's all just a big joke. Maybe it's just 
a voice in the head that doesn't have any, any real reality and we're just giving it meaning because we think it has reality. It was something like that that I connected with. And all I can say is that it threw me into a space of inner silence that was so vast that it, it felt like it swallowed up the whole universe. And for the first time, I was really able to experience the background of stillness behind the moving pictures of life. And I was able to connect with this idea we call oneness. However you, you try to describe oneness, it always ends up sounding dumb, but there was that recognition I'd always heard about. The sky, the trees, the birds, all the other people. It was all just me, like in a big dream or something. And the recognition was so overwhelmingly blissful that I just started laughing, almost hysterically laughing. It seems so obvious to me now. Was I just walking through life with blindfold on? How did I not see this? It's so obvious this is the nature of reality. And so I'm up there laughing hysterically, sobbing, weeping bitterly, and people are looking over at me like, that guy's having an interesting lunch break. <laughs> and so from that moment on, I spent a two week period in that sort of samadhi state with a very Buddha-like state of consciousness, you might say, where it was impossible to even remember what suffering felt like. All of the years of, of crippling depression were sort of swallowed up in an instant. And the sense of being a separate individual self was also swallowed up because of that recognition that it's all just one happening, one energy, one intelligence knowing itself. And the love I felt for each and every thing I saw was equal to the love I felt for myself, no difference whatsoever. There was just this pure awareness and it was just ecstatic. And so after two weeks of that, essentially what happened was I woke up on the morning of two weeks later and a thought appeared in my mind that said, I wonder if this will be my permanent state of consciousness now. But I wasn't aware that that was actually the first thought of ego coming back online. And from that point on, those thoughts slowly creeped back in and that state of, of oneness, we might say, seemed to slip away and all the suffering thoughts slowly came back on. And as they did, there was a panic developing within me, like an existential crisis of, oh my gosh, I'm losing this state. I thought it was a permanent state. Now the old Aaron's coming back, the depression's coming back. And that's not what I want. Like, I don't want to ever leave this state. I was clinging to it, clawing on it, trying to keep it close to me. And it was just being ripped away almost right out of my hands. And so when it finally settled in, and the full persona of Aaron coming back online, the depression was, it felt three times worse because I, I felt like I was given a free sample of enlightenment and I wasted it, I squandered it, I lost it. I did something wrong to lose it. I lost the pearl of great price. And so that's where my dark night of the soul sort of began. But because I had that proof, nothing else really mattered to me anymore. I sort of just walked out of my life I walked out of fitness modeling, bodybuilding, personal training, and I just said, nothing else matters at this point other than returning to that state, uh, figuring out how I can integrate that state of consciousness permanently. And if I can learn how to do that, I'm gonna devote my life to teaching the world how to do it. The amazing thing about reality is that it can't be escaped. It can't be avoided. And this was another recognition I had during my dark night where the the suicidal thoughts and the depression was so intense that there was that, that voice in the head of like, just it's better to just end it, man. Why be here anymore? When your mind is feeding it to you day and night, it's, it can be hard to escape. But I, I couldn't ever bring myself to that because there was something inside of me that intuitively said, that's not how this reality works. There is no escaping it. If you, if you do that, you'll just be back here in another body trying to learn the same lessons again. So it's to your best interest to learn the lessons now, to face your demons and put the pedal to the metal and go for it. In fact, that's why your soul came here. And so most people probably know me as a Law of One teacher and people secondarily know me as an A Course in Miracles teacher. Those are to me the two texts that really were the springboard for my spiritual evolution because I think most of us who leave our religion are forced to wrestle with questions like, well, if that version of God isn't real, then maybe there isn't a God like I thought. Maybe, maybe atheism is true. 
maybe there's just nothing after this. And that thought terrified me because what that implied to me was I'll never see my family again after this life. You know, when they pass, that's it. All the love we ever shared, all the memories just get swallowed up into some endless abyss, never to be seen or remembered again. And for some reason that, that was just insufferable to think about. I'd heard from someone somewhere about this channel text called the Law of One and finally got around to saying, I'm gonna crack this thing open. And it really gives you a metaphysical map of the cosmos you're inside of, the blueprint for reincarnation and the soul's evolutionary journey. And it fills the reader, I think, with so much hope and purpose and enthusiasm for life when you see that you are a soul on an evolutionary journey and you've likely lived thousands of lifetimes in other forms and have many thousands yet to live on this path. It gave me something I hadn't had since I was a Christian kid, which was real purpose to wake up with every day that I want to grow, I want to seek, I want to devote myself to something higher.